there are two hard problems in computer science. Cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. Thank you, good night. <laughs> All right. So uh, I work at a company called No Red Ink, and we make grammar and writing software for English teachers. Um, it's an awesome company where we've got students answering about two million questions a day. Uh, there's a team of four full-time programmers making this happen, so no pressure. Um, and uh, we use these technologies. We like React, uh, Flux, and CoffeeScript. So all of this is like right up our alley. I'm really excited to be talking here today because we're among friends. Um, so uh, aside from No Red Ink, uh, I also have a personal project that I've been working on. It's called Dreamwriter. And this is something that I built to scratch my own itch. Um, I like to write novels. And uh, initially, my sort of instinct was to reach for Google Docs when writing a novel. But I ran into a couple of problems. Um, for one thing, it didn't have the feature set that I wanted. So I wanted things like you know, a notion of chapters, like a first class notion where I could just like, click on a chapter and go to it. I could be like, all right, I want to make a new chapter. And you know, title it, you know, state something. Um, and just have it update in the outline you know, over here on the left as I'm writing. Um, Typing one-handed with a microphone. Um, and I want to have like a word count at the bottom, you know, that's, that's sort of updating as I'm typing. Um, I want like a full screen distraction-free writing mode, right, where everything fades out but my words and I can just sort of hover if I want to get the UI back, right? These like, these niceties that, that, uh, that I sort of wanted to have. So I built the first version of this in CoffeeScript. And this was actually the first version, the first prototype, I guess, was, uh, was before React was uh, open source. So I didn't really have that yet. So I kind of built it using the tools I had. And, uh, iterated, 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 and was like, yes, this is the design I want. This is what I want to be writing in. Um, and of course, by this point, it was a horrible, unmaintainable mess after all these iterations. And so I was quickly like, okay, I like using this, but um, every time I find a bug, fixing it is miserable. And uh, so I, I need to rewrite this. So by this time, Flux had, uh, Facebook uh, had released React and Flux and all these nice tools. And so I was like, okay, cool, I'm going to rewrite it using these. And I got about halfway through rewriting it when this blog post came out, Blazing Fast HTML, Virtual DOM and Elm. And so I started reading about this. I was like, okay, this sounds cool. And I got down to this graphic. This is a benchmark of the to-do MVC application. I was comparing a number of popular JS frameworks to Ohm, uh, which we talked about a little bit earlier, which I was familiar with, um, and Elm. And Elm is doing really well. I was like, whoa, this got my attention, okay. Um, because performance was one of the other things that I was running into difficulties with, uh, with Google Docs. Turns out if you try to stick a 100,000 word novel in Google Docs, like, go get a coffee, because it's going to be really painfully slow. And so then I started poking around on the site, and I found out, oh, this is actually architected a lot like if you took React and Flux and Immutability and, like, built a whole language and ecosystem around them. That's really cool. And there were some other things that were really interesting. And then I saw this. This is on the Elm website. This is the time-traveling debugger. So there's a version of it on the website that you can try out without having to download anything. Um, but you can also download it and use it with your own app. Um, so here's how it works. So I got Mario here, over here on the right. I've got the code that's generating this on the left. So I can run around, I can jump, whee! Having some fun jumping. There's an interesting rendering artifact there. Not sure why that's happening. Um, but so you can see kind of the path in the background there uh, that, that you know, Mario is taking. And, uh, so okay, that's pretty cool. You see there's this number going up here on the right. So I can pause and that number stops going up. And that's because now I've stopped time. It's actually been remembering everything that I've been doing up to this point. So now I can actually rewind time if I want. I can say, okay, let's go back here. Let's look at what Mario was doing at this time. Let's look at what Mario was doing at this time. It's, it's kind of laggy. Maybe I should refresh, sorry. I said before this talk that nothing would go wrong and I'm getting what I deserve. Um, okay, there we go, that's better. Yeah, good point. Okay, so more display wonkiness, sorry about that. Um, I also said earlier that there would be no problems with the display, so I'm really, really seriously getting what I deserve on that. Okay, so Mario's jumping around, we're pausing. We can rewind time. This is gonna look better this time, I bet. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool, so we're retracing Mario's steps, we're going backwards in time. Now, this is kinda cool. Wouldn't it be cool if I could like go up here and then change my code and see what that looked like? Let's, uh, let's, let's mess with the gravity here. We've actually got a little slider here on this live code editor. So this is actually recompiling the code, rerunning it, and actually replaying the entire application history of 
all the user inputs as I do this on the fly. This is not a made up toy example. This is real Elm code. So I saw this and was like, man, I saw Brett Victor talk about this like two years ago where he was like, like five to 10 years from now, it'd be really nice if we had something like this that really worked on real code. And I'm like, wait, this is here? This already exists? This is like a real thing that I can use right now? Whoa. <laughs> so now I had this choice to make, right? I'm in the middle of this big rewrite. And it's like, okay, you take the blue pill. Story ends. You go back to CoffeeScript, which you know, and React and Flux and these tools that you're comfortable with, that you're happy with using at work. Or you take the red pill. You see how deep the rabbit hole goes. I took the red pill. And the red pill is awesome. I really recommend the red pill. Um, it's a great pill. Um, <laughs> and um, so let's, um, let's build something. Um, let's, uh, let me go back to the DreamWriter real quick. So uh, one of the things that DreamWriter has is it has a note system. So you can uh, you know, write notes about various different parts of your novel that you're working on. Um, like I, I got some matrix specific notes in here. Um, one liners from the matrix, things like that. I could have used that as a joke earlier. Um, and, uh, and so basically you've got these, these things and uh, these are the notes that we'll be using as our uh, demo here. Um, you can click on one of the notes and then it brings up the note, you can edit it and so forth. Very straightforward, um, there's a sort of a full text search uh, system built in there that runs in the browser, it's pretty cool. Um, but we're just gonna be building this, this basic idea of okay, we wanna display the search results that the users um, search for and then we're gonna click on one of these notes and bring it up, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, cool, pretty straightforward. So, uh, we're gonna start off with a model, right? We wanna model our data. Uh, so we've got two things that we care about in this world. One is the notion of a note and the note has a title and a body, they're both strings. And then we have the sidebar model which is gonna represent that portion of the sidebar that we care about. So it's got two things. It's got a list of notes, so that's the search results we were talking about. And then it's got the current note, which is either a current note, if they've clicked on one, or nothing. And that's represented by a maybe note. So quick show of hands, how many people, um, actually, let me back up a step. How many people, um, before they heard about this event tonight, had heard of Elm? Nice, all right. Um, how many people are familiar with maybe? Okay, so uh, let's do a quick primer then. Uh, so if you're not, if you never used a, a language that uses maybe, uh, maybe is basically a container that either contains one value or it contains nothing at all. So for example, um, here's how you build maybe containers. So uh, you can either use just, and if you call just passing in a value, you've now got a maybe container with that value in it, or you can call nothing, and nothing will give you an empty maybe container. So if we call just foo in quotes, then now we've got a maybe container with a string in it. And if we've got nothing, we've got an empty maybe container. Pretty straightforward. Here is um, our model again. And uh, so current note is a maybe note because either we've got the current note if the user clicked on it, or we've got nothing if they haven't clicked on any of them yet. Okay, so this is what it would look like to actually instantiate those. So previously we just sort of described the structure but this is what it looks like to actually instantiate some of these notes. So just, and then in uh, curly braces, this is how you uh, define a record in Elm. So records are basically like JSON objects in the sense that they're objects but they don't have prototypes and they don't have methods, they're just data. Um, so we can do that and then uh, of course if we don't have any notes, then uh, it's nothing. Okay, so let's, um, let's define a couple of notes here that we'll be using throughout this example. Um, they just have various different things. I've ahead of time because I'm extremely prepared. Um, typed all three of these into the notes in DreamWriter, so we'll, if we take a look at that real quick. Uh, these are those three notes, okay? Pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we've got our sidebar model, which has notes and current notes, so notes is just a list of those three notes. Um, square brackets are for making a list. And uh, the current note, which we're gonna start off with nothing because the user hasn't clicked on anything yet. Okay. So we've got that sidebar model. We've got uh, a view function next, yes? Uh, we need to make something that takes that model and actually makes, you know, res returns something renderable. We're gonna um, define this function. This is just a plain vanilla Elm function. 
uh, you see it's got uh, view, which is the name of the function, and then the argument, which is model, and then equals. So in Elm, if you're defining a function, you put the arguments to the left of the equals sign. Uh, so we're gonna use a case expression to check what kind of current note we have, since that's gonna determine which of the two types of views we're gonna make, right? Either we're gonna have the list of all the, uh, all the notes like this, or if the user has selected a current note, it's gonna be a completely different UI that looks like this. Okay, so uh, case, it works kind of like switch in the sense that we've got two options. The current note could either be nothing or it could be just something. Uh, one of the cool parts about how case expressions work in Elm is they do a pattern match. So that means that not only is this saying we've got just something, we're actually able to give that something a name and sort of pull it out of the container at the same time. So it's pretty convenient. Um, so we're saying just and then current note is the name we're giving the thing that was in that maybe container. Okay, so in the current note case where we actually have something in there, we're gonna just call view note editor and we're, that's gonna take care of rendering the view for one particular note and pass in that current note. Uh, in the case of nothing, we need to actually make a list. So we're gonna call ul, which is for unordered list. Um, this is just a plain vanilla Elm function, by the way. Elm has a really nice namespacing system, so you can pull in things like a DSL for um, representing you know, DOM elements uh, and just have them right at the top level. It's really nice. Um, we're gonna give it, uh, it takes a list of attributes as its first argument, so we're only gonna give it one attribute. We're gonna give it an ID called note list. Um, and then as its second argument over here, uh, it takes a list of children. So to get that list of children, we're gonna call map, passing in a function called view note, which is gonna re uh, render one of the uh, LIs, like a list uh, item. And then we're gonna pass in model.notes and we're gonna map over that. So that was our, remember from back up top, we have uh, three notes up there. We're gonna map over those and use view note to render each of them as a list item. Okay, something to note about this, this function here, is that it has no side effects and it doesn't look at any state other than the model that you give it. All it does is it takes this model and it returns something else, right? It returns this UL or it returns whatever view note editor is gonna return. And in this case, what they're returning is virtual DOM elements, which Elm HTML then takes care of rendering. So Elm HTML does blazing fast rendering. This is where those awesome benchmarks came from. And Elm HTML basically uses every trick in the book to make rendering really fast. So it uses the fact that you're using a lot of immutability under the hood to do really quick referential equality checks. Um, it uses DOM diffing that's really fast to make sure it's just mutating the bare minimum of DOM elements on the screen when it updates. It does batched updates with request animation frame. Really, seriously, the kitchen sink to get like the maximum amount of performance. It's really nice. But it's also really nice that you get all of that just out of this one function that has no side effects and doesn't look at state. It is a stateless function, or a pure function, or referentially transparent function, whatever you wanna call it. I like stateless. Um, but the idea is same arguments, same result. And what's nice about having your view functions work like this is that they're extremely cacheable, right? All stateless functions are cacheable. Same arguments, same results means that if, you get, if you're going to give it the same arguments and you already know the result from having run it once before, you can just skip the whole thing and just say, okay, let's just shortcut straight to the result. And I, had, I experienced the power of this um, when I was writing Dreamwriter. I had this experience where I was typing in that note search field, I was typing really fast, and I noticed that it was lagging. Like the, the characters were taking a second to come up after I hit the keys. And that's because on every single keystroke, it was getting an update and it was re-rendering the entire UI, the left sidebar, the editor, the right sidebar, everything. And I was like, man, that sucks. Um, well, now it's time to do performance optimization. I've been there before, you know days of compiling things into type loops and you know, t doing profiling and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, um, Elm has this function called lazy. And basically, instead of calling view model, you just stick lazy in front, you say lazy, and view is the first argument, and then model is the second argument. Basically, it takes whatever function you give it, and whatever argument you give it, and it checks to see if you ran that function already. And if so, it just says, okay, we're just gonna substitute the result and not call the function. So I was like, okay, that sounds like that could have some performance benefits, so I tried putting it here, putting another one here, lazy this, lazy that. I put it about like five different places. I was like, okay, let's see what that got me. Boom, everything's instantaneous. Like what? This, how did this not take days? I'm used to performance problems this nasty being, you know, um, taking a long time. But the fact that all of your view functions are stateless like this means that performance optimizing them becomes really, really easy. It's a good thing. Okay, so we've got our model and now we've got a view function. And if we call our view function, passing in that model, 
now we get these virtual DOM elements that LMHTML takes care of rendering really fast. So far, so good. So note that current note here is nothing. And if we want to render that other view, we're in exactly the same world, except the current note is now just note two instead of nothing. This is if the user clicked on the second note in the list. And that will accomplish rendering the, the current note view instead of the list of search results. Cool. So that's nice, but um, we would kind of like to have an interactive application, right? That would be sweet. Um, so how do we take what we just did manually and make it so that the browser does it automatically? So the first thing, and this is where uh, you know, Flux type things are going to sound familiar, is we're actually going to model this update as data. So like in Flux you have, these are called actions, and it's basically you have a payload um, that describes what you want the update to be. And this is really nice because you can pass them around and do cool things with them um, rather than just sort of mutating it in place in a very imperative way. So this is a much more functional alternative. So we're gonna define our update. This is what it's like in data to update the current note. So um, this type update is basically making an enumeration of sort of abstract values. These don't necessarily map to like a string or an integer or anything. They're just sort of abstract alternatives. So the first one is no change, which is sort of the default case that's sort of boring and doesn't do anything and we're just kind of including it for something that'll become useful later. And then the pipe separates the, all the different alternatives. So the only other alternative is set current note. And that's an update that, as you might expect, will change the current note um, of the model. And it takes uh, a maybe note as a payload because maybe note is what uh, the, the current note is because it's either the note if the user's clicked on one or nothing if they haven't. All right, so let's take that and now let's write a transition function that takes that update and a model and returns a new model that has applied that update to it. So again, we're gonna use a case expression, um, case update of, and then we've got two cases once again, no change, which is the boring ca ch case where we just take the model in and we just return it. No change. And then set current note, which is the other one we care about. Once again, we're gonna use the fact that this is a pattern match to pull out the, uh, the payload there. Uh, we're gonna call it note or nothing, because it's either a note or it's nothing, because it's a maybe. And then this last line here is saying we're gonna take the model, we're gonna clone it, and then the clone is gonna be exactly the same, except that we're gonna change the current note to be note or nothing. So we've got an exact copy of the model, but with current note changed to whatever the payload of that update was. Um, Elm, like ClojureScript, uses all persistent data structures under the hood. So this is really fast. Even if you have a really big model and you're making a lot of changes to it, it's all very fast because it's doing node sharing, good stuff like that under the hood. And this is at no extra cost to you, this is just how you sort of use it normally. Once again, you may notice that this is also a stateless function, right? We're just taking uh, the update as an argument, we're taking the model as an argument, and if you give it the same update and the same model, you're gonna get the same result every time with no side effects. So this is cool because the more stateless functions you have, the easier it becomes to find bugs, right? If you have a whole bunch of these, then you can say certain things about them. Like if you have three stateless functions, no matter what order they run in, no matter whether they're concurrent or anything else, if you have one of them that's involved in an AJAX request, another one that's involved in writing to index DB, doesn't matter, they can't affect each other. So when you're hunting down bugs, all of the functions that you're sure are stateless, you know cannot be responsible for your bug unless the function you're worried about is calling them. Right? So the more of this we have, the better. And so it's nice that so far, the two things we've seen, both view and transition, transition in particular, which is usually something that involves mutation, are both stateless functions. Okay, so let's put this together with what we've done so far. So we got our model again at the top. Now we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna have an update, which we're going to instantiate one of those update instances uh, with a payload of just note two. So this is going to describe the idea of changing current note from nothing or whatever it was before to just note two. We're gonna have a new model, which we're going to get by calling transition, passing that update and the model. That's going to give us that clone with uh, current note change to just note two, because that's what's in the update. And then we're gonna call view on new model. So this is basically the same way of doing what we did earlier, except that now we've actually done it all in code. Okay, cool. We still haven't made an interactive though. So to do that, uh, we're going to introduce one more concept, which is the channel. So this is how a channel works. It's a basic pub-sub system. Uh, you make a channel, you send messages to it, and you have a subscriber that listens to that channel, and whenever it receives a message, the subscriber gets the value that's in that message. Pretty straightforward. Um, so we're going to make a channel of updates. So when we're gonna send a, an update to that channel, a subscriber is going to be listening, it's gonna get that update, and it's gonna do something with it. 
So here's an example. Um, the, the send function here uh, is what we use to send things to the channel. But as has become a recurring trend now, uh, this doesn't actually do an imperative mutation update you know, in place. What it does is it actually encapsulates the idea of sending this value to that channel and wraps it up in a message. So you can now pass that message around, but it doesn't actually do anything right at the time that you call it. You hand it off to something that will do something with it later, but once again, we still have all of the same properties that we had before, where send is a stateless function. Cool. Okay, so now we've got a channel that is capable of receiving updates. So let's hook it in um, uh, to a subscriber also. Uh, here's how we hook it in. On click, pretty straightforward. Um, this is one of the things that you can put in your property list for elements. So this is that view note function from earlier. Um, it's an li because we're mapping over the list of notes to put these in the, in the UL, the unordered list. Um, specifically, this is, These guys, these are the LIs in question, and when, when you click on them, we want them to run that update that's changing the, uh, the current note. And this is how we specify that. We use exactly the same syntax we had on the previous slide, send to the channel this type of update. And so, like I said, right here, this is not actually sending that. And it would be kind of bad if it did because we're just kind of trying to describe this here, right? We don't actually want to send that message every time you call this function. We want it to send on click. So that's why it's important that this is actually a function that wraps up a description of how to send a message to that channel rather than actually doing it on the spot. So we got this message and we passed that to onClick. So now we've hooked everything up. When onClick runs, it's going to send an update to that channel and then that's going to do some other stuff. Specifically, it's going to do this. It's going to loop back and give us uh, an updated model after running it through the transition function, and that's going to become our new model, which will then get re-rendered. If this looks familiar, it's because we've been talking about it all night. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a unidirectional graph, right? Um, like flux. So in the upper left, we have the model. Uh, so we've got our list of notes. We have our current note, which starts off being nothing, but which, because it's a maybe container, we can put stuff in it. We take that model, we pass it to the view. The view returns a representation of this in virtual DOM nodes, which then gets passed off to the Elm HTML runtime. And that runtime, which is completely outside our code base, which is nice, um, takes care of rendering it really quickly, rendering updates really quickly, and also setting up that on-click handler, actually attaching that to the DOM node, such that when it runs, we get one of those update data structures that represents the idea of changing the current node, and that gets sent off to the update channel. I'm gonna run around here. So the update channel gets that. It starts off with a default value of no change because it doesn't want to start by updating anything. When it gets one of these, like let's say we clicked on note two, just note two comes in here. That gets passed into the transition function, which as you recall, returns a new model. So now we've got our updated model, which goes and becomes the new current model of the world, which then gets run to the view function, which gets passed to HTML, which does quick diffing and updating the screen, and cool. So now, we've got a complete UI. We built a complete UI. But we did it in kind of a cool way because this is all immutable data. This is a stateless function. This is immutable data. This is immutable data. That's a stateless function, and that's immutable data. So we've used nothing but immutable data and stateless functions the whole time. Cool. Okay, what does that get us? Well, it gets us all the nice properties that we talked about earlier within the confines of our UI, right? So things are easier to debug. Everything is cacheable. Things are easier to, to, to look at, just to understand what they do. You can just look at a function and look at its arguments and say, okay, that's all there is to this function. I don't have to mock things when I'm writing tests. I don't have to think, oh, okay, um, but in this time when it runs, it might be a little bit different because it's looking at, nope, just look at its functions, look at what it returns. That's all there is to it. So each of these components is necessarily very simple really nice to work with. But there's a problem here, right? Because um, we could write all this stuff in JavaScript. We could choose to write stateless functions for everything. We'd probably have to write some wrappers around various things to make them accept that. But we could totally do this. The trouble is, we have to do that all using discipline, right? Um, we don't have like something that's guaranteeing that they're stateless. It's just they happen to be stateless. Which is a problem when you're debugging because like if I'm writing a JavaScript function and I'm like, okay, 
Uh, I've said that this is stateless, but as it turns out, oops, I'm actually calling somebody else's library, which I kind of assumed was stateless, but it turned out not to be, whoops. Um, and uh, now there's actually a mutation here. And now I'm kind of like, well, wait, what's real, what's not? You know, I, I want to like rely on these guarantees, but they're not guarantees. Um, it's all discipline. And, and discipline is hard. Invariants are easy, but discipline is hard. So wouldn't it be nice if there were some way to make use of the fact that we can do all this stuff using stateless functions and actually put some invariants around certain parts of our code base that we know can be done using nothing but stateless functions and immutable data. So there's a problem there because at the end of the day, this is JavaScript, right? We have to mutate the DOM to do anything. Um, in React, even if you take as much, you know, um, statelessness as you can, use immutable data as much as you can, build up your components in a completely declarative way, you still gotta call react.render to take that component and attach it to the DOM. There's no getting around this, this is unavoidable. You need this one line of boilerplate, even if nothing else, so you have to have the concept of mutability. And this is where Elm does something really interesting. So Elm takes this one line of boilerplate and just says, we're not doing that in Elm. We're gonna have one line of JavaScript boilerplate per Elm app, and your entire Elm library can, or, sorry, your entire Elm application can compile down and look kind of like a library that this one line of JavaScript boilerplate uses. Cool, so that means that literally all the Elm code we just did can actually be stateless functions and immutable data the whole way through. We don't have to write a single line of Elm code that's not any of those things. So that's cool. Um, what, what about invariants? Can we get any invariants about that? What if I told you that all of Elm is immutable data and stateless functions. The invariant holds across the entire language. So you actually don't have to worry about those things. You don't ever have to say, what if this function's called? Nope, it can't. Seriously, not, not possible. Um, all you can do in Elm is work with immutable data and stateless functions. So this is not immutable by default. It's immutable's the only game in town. Um, right, yeah, seriously, yeah. <laughs> And it turns out, it gets better. Because this, these have really nice properties on their own, but it turns out when you have a whole language built around that, and you can make assumptions based on that, you can design some really crazy awesome properties. Let me give you an example. So we're all very familiar with this. For those of you in the back, this says undefined is not a function. I probably didn't need to finish that sentence because you've seen it so often that you're very, very familiar with it. Um, so this is a runtime exception, right? We're familiar with dealing with runtime exceptions, and um, one of the, tools that we have to deal with these are source maps. So uh, I remember using CoffeeScript before it had source maps, and it wasn't too bad, right? Um, when you get this exception, you'd see instead of editor.coffee over there on the right, you'd see editor.js, which is the compiled version. You click on it, and because CoffeeScript semantics are really close to JavaScript semantics, you could see, okay, like I figure out where in my code this is, um, not, not without too much difficulty. Um, but source maps are nicer, right? It's much better to be able to click on this and just go right to the point in your code that was the offending line that caused this crash. Um, that's good, but it turns out there's something better. Um, so in Elm, I actually have no idea what compiled Elm code looks like, because this has never happened to me. I've written thousands of lines of Elm code on Dreamwriter. By the way, what you saw earlier is the rewrite in Elm. That wasn't the CoffeeScript version. Um, it does a lot of powerful stuff. It's not like a toy app. It's not a weird use case. It's just a normal use case, not one. It's never happened. That's better than source maps, let me tell you. Um, I gotta be careful not to get used to that because every time this happens at work, I'm like, ah, this, why, why is this still a thing? Um, it's fantastic not having to deal with this anymore. And it's because Elm is built on these really simple, really powerful ideas and the whole language is built around them. It's awesome. Um, I would like to talk about all of the other awesome things about Elm because honestly, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is not even the stuff that I won't shut up about to my coworkers, but um, this talk is supposed to be 30 minutes and although I don't have a timer, I'm pretty sure I'm already over. So um, I just wanna talk about one more thing because there's gotta be a question on everyone's mind which is, okay, it's really cool that you're allowed to work in immutable data and stateless functions in the whole language, but I know for a fact that there are JavaScript APIs out there that are not compatible with that, right? They require mutation, they require stateful updates, which is totally true, and that's why Elm has ports. So ports allow you to communicate with arbitrary JavaScript, and this is another interesting approach that I haven't seen in other languages. 
So Elm basically treats arbitrary external JavaScript as like a third party service, kind of like the browser treats the server. So you communicate to it, but you communicate to it in this structured way that allows Elm to preserve all of its internal invariants while still talking to JavaScript. So I'm using this for several things in DreamWriter. Um, I, that full screen API that I showed you earlier, that's something that requires you know, imperative calls in JavaScript. I just do it through a port. The full text search library, I didn't re-implement that in the browser. Are you kidding me? That's a lot of work. I just used some JavaScript library that someone else wrote, and I talked to it using ports. Um, DreamWriter actually works completely offline, like you can bring it up with the app cache and just completely use it. Um, and so it uses IndexedDB to store everything. Uh, again, doing that through ports. So basically anywhere where you can't have these really nice you know, invariants and still use the JavaScript APIs or the JavaScript libraries that you need to use, ports to the rescue. So sum up, we have a time traveling debugger, which is so cool. We have blazing fast performance, which is fantastic because I don't know if you guys have looked at as many compiled to JavaScript libraries as I have, but some of them are really slow. Elm is blazing fast. It's the fastest thing I've ever used. Um, and no runtime exceptions. Like, basically not ever. I, it's theoretically possible, but it really honestly has not happened to me yet. Um, it feels like they're almost extinct. If they're not extinct, they're totally endangered. So it gets this because it's built on these simple and powerful ideas. And it's really nice working with them. Um, Elm has been like one of the most fun things to program in. Um, it's become my favorite programming language, honestly. Um, and uh, I really just can't say enough exciting things about it. It's not even on 1.0 yet, and it's this awesome. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I won't shut up about it. Uh, all I'll do is say, take the red pill. Check it out, elmlang.org. We have a mailing list. We have an awesome community, lots of very friendly people. Um, the creator is here on the couch. Uh, he's really awesome and smart and wrote all this. And, uh, and he's also super friendly, so you should uh, definitely talk to him afterwards. Um, one last note, uh, like I said, I work for No Red Ink, and we are hiring, we are so hiring. Um, and we want awesome people who like things like this. Uh, like I said, we use CoffeeScript, we use React, we use Flux, and we use immutability as much as possible in the front end. On the back end, we use Rails, which is other people's departments, but they're also here, and they're also awesome. Yeah, they're waving. Um, and uh, so you should definitely talk to us if you're interested in working on these kinds of things. Thanks very much.